originally, you know, originally I did a newspaper column under the name Joe Bob Briggs mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. back in uh, starting in in 1982, mm-hmm. and I uh, I wanted a name that would um, that would be kind of a um, uh, a misfit and an outcast mm-hmm. and an independent guy and a and a populist and a westerner and the first name I came up with I wanted to sort of combine I wanted to have somebody who was a who was a hybrid of all the western cultures mm-hmm. and so the first name I tried was Bobo Rodriguez <laughs> and he was half Mexican and half white trash uh-huh. and, uh, and uh, my editor at the time didn't want me to use the name Bobo Rodriguez because he thought it was um, uh, racist. Yeah. And I said, uh, I told him, I said, no, you don't get the point. It's the first anti-racist name ever invented because it's like it's somebody that's it's so mixed up racially he doesn't know what he is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he's like the ultimate outcast. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was going to do it, you know, with a partial uh, Mexican accent and a par- partial white trash accent. I, think, I still think it would have been a funny, uh, a funny concept. But anyway, he said, no, 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 make it a white name. So I said, okay, I'm going to make it the whitest, the whitest trash name I can think of. Some cold, hard name that everybody that ever hears this name can feel superior to it. You know? And so we'll never have this problem of me making fun of anybody, you know. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I thought Briggs sounded yeah. hard, and I just tried a bunch of different names. I didn't want it to be, um, uh, I didn't want it to be a cliche name like. Uh, Billy Bob is the name you use when you have a, when you just want to use a cliched Texas name, you know. Right. I went, I went for Joe Bob, and then I picked Briggs as a, as a, as just a, a name you can feel good about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know you're smarter than this guy, you know. Has any uh, real Briggs people ever gotten a hold of you, family members, that was called Briggs? Well, yeah, occasionally I do hear from some. There, were, there were, turned out to be one guy who was named Joe Briggs. I don't know if it was <laughs> Joe Bob Briggs, but... All of a sudden, he's a celebrity. But he was—he gets calls from time to time. He lives in Houston. <laughs> oh my! He wasn't too happy about it. He had to unlist his phone number. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> but um, um, that was the idea. It's sort of like—it's uh, sort of the old. Um, it's it's an old uh, it's an old convention of the guy who um, you try to make the guy appear to be as. Um, as stupid as possible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that you can suck people in who don't realize how smart underneath he really is. Mm-hmm. You know, he's like the yeah. guy who tricks the city mm-hmm. slickers that come to town. Yeah. That was the idea. What kind of reaction have you gotten from uh, born and raised Texans about how you portray Joe Bob and perhaps even Texans? Well, you know what? The strangest thing is, over the years, I, like when I, when I do my... Uh, I have a one-man show that I do called An Evening with Joe Bob Briggs. Is this your stand-up? Yeah, routine? it's not really stand-up. I don't do traditional stand-up so much as um, it's uh, it's more of a it's more of a theatrical show. It's more of, it's more comic acting than mm-hmm. than just uh, you know holding forth on different topics. But I uh, um, the, I get the best reception in in cities like uh, San Francisco. You know, very urban places, very sophisticated places. And in, in Texas, I'm more often, I'm, I'm more likely to get comments like, why do you hold us up to public ridicule like that to the rest of the country? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's like, that's mm-hmm. what I thought. <laughs> it's like, uh, um, they're not, um, not, not that I don't, you know, not that I don't have fans in Texas too, but it's like, uh, it's like the last place that I'll ever get, uh, you know, much, much respect. Mm-hmm. Um, and originally, I thought I thought the character would be really well liked in the South, mm-hmm. but it's not so much. Um, uh, you know, it, it, I, I have I have better support in the rest of the country than I do in the South. Mm-hmm. Has anybody ever gotten totally ticked to the point of threatening you or anything? Not threatening me physically. I mean, mm-hmm. many people have um, have uh, called for my ouster. Um, usually. Not individuals so much as organized groups who feel like I've picked on their particular cause. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is a this is an occupational hazard of almost anybody that does comedy these days. But um, the feminists have uh, several times gotten mad at me. <coughs> most, most recently, the um, radical lesbian 
feminists. I had a whole thing this summer where mm-hmm. I talked about going to the National Lesbian Conference and, yeah, right. and getting beat up and, <laughs> and uh, getting beat up by some lesbians, and they protested. And then I, I, uh, I made a public apology, um, which made a matter <laughs> because of the way I apologized. You would have to see the tape. Yeah. To <laughs> well, I believe Mary sent us yeah, a we've seen uh, some preview of some, some of that? your okay. segments in that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, Oh, the f- fundamentalists were were mad at me, have have gotten mad at me for various things I've said that were. They usually the thing that makes them mad is sex. You know, if mm-hmm. you talk about sex and and uh, the Catholics got mad at me for a couple of remarks I made about uh, Catholics one time, and you know it's like um, what I tell people is this kind of satire. It's like. Uh, you you put a machine gun on a swivel and you just hit this target and this target and this target and this target and this target at random. Mm-hmm. You know, and about one in 20 will scream. So you hit them 20 more times. That's how you find out where the sacred cow is, you know, and then you just destroy that sacred cow. So it's like, I don't choose particular causes, you know, to make fun of. Mm-hmm. But when I do make fun of one that really, like, really hits a nerve, yeah. um, I go ahead and make fun of it some more because it's so much fun to get the when people get excited about uh, you know whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You for make some uh, reason the feminists always come back for more. It's like whatever you say. <laughs> that's the reason I've made so many feminist jokes over the years. It's like whatever you say, they yeah. cannot just keep their mouth shut. They will come back and <laughs> protest and write you letters and complain and try to get you fired, and so it just stokes the fires. And you get caught up in it, and you make another joke, and then you make another joke, you know. And so, more or less, like, keep the so, ball rolling. Well, you'll have to excuse me, Becky, but that's the general makeup of a woman. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's why. Well, yeah, some I people know. ask me, what have you got against women? What have you got against women? I said, I don't have anything against women. I said, they are just the most fun to argue with, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Do you ever make the movie channel nervous with the things you do? Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, we've had our little discussions over the years about um, the wonderful thing for me is that, you know, two things. Being on late night, you get to be looser. Mm-hmm. Being on premium cable, it's the only TV in the world where you have absolutely no pressure from advertisers ever. Right. People, It's the only TV that <laughs> goes direct from you to the consumer. Mm-hmm. Um, every other kind of TV... You're, the consumer is the product. The advertiser is buying the consumer from the producer. You know what I mean? Yeah, I sure do. And so in this kind of TV, the consumer is actually buying your program. Mm-hmm. Well, it's wonderful because all you have to do is keep the majority of those consumers uh, watching and happy, and you've done your job. And every, every other kind of TV, you've got to keep them happy, and then you've also got to keep some guy in the middle happy that might be Procter & Gamble, and it might be Chrysler, and it might be... <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's why TV writers are tearing out their hair all the time over the ridiculous things they're asked to change. And well, they probably tend to tune in knowing that that's their type of forte that they like to uh, watch, too. Like with basic cable or whatever, it's just something that's on, but if you know a certain movie or a certain host is coming up, you turn to it. Right. You know. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, but, you know, the, we, so we've had our little discussions. Yeah. And for a while, when I first came to uh, cable, I thought, I thought, this is great. <laughs> this, is, this is the place, this is the only place in the world that has no taste standards. <laughs> and then, I found out no, that's not true. No, they had a, uh, they actually had the Showtime and the Movie Channel had a director of uh, standards and practices when I first got there. Mm-hmm. Then after about after I was there about three months, the guy died, <laughs> and they never replaced him. Oh, my. Just pioneering, bringing people things that uh, are indeed too grisly for the for uh, regular TV mm-hmm. or. Not necessarily too grisly, but just too something for the taste standards of uh, normal TV. Did they ever get around to showing Chainsaw 1? We've never shown Chainsaw 1 because, strangely enough, it went into syndication in a, in a greatly altered version mm. so that the rights are tied up for a certain period of time. When it becomes available, I'm sure we might be the first ones to show it uncut. 
I was wondering why they would show, like, for, you know, for instance, Chainsaw 2 or 3 and not 1. Well, one reason they do it is because Chainsaw 3, for example, is so chopped up yeah. that it's not even... Uh, first of all, it doesn't even make a lick of sense. No, it doesn't. But, uh, I didn't like it at all. But it's got... Uh, they, they chopped it up in order to get an R so that they could get their theatrical release, and they ruined it at that stage. Mm -hmm. And no one has ever restored it to its original version, which I understand it was a pretty good movie. But you'll notice there are entire scenes um, cut out of it where you don't even understand why that little girl is in the story. And, uh, you know, well, the reason is the scenes involving her were too graphic to get past the MPAA ratings board, and so they changed it. And, and so it's easy to show that one on TV because... But people hate it when we show it. Yeah. They say, what was that? Why did you show that? Mm -hmm. I got a kick out of a letter uh, in your newsletter that you sent me of uh, your followers, your viewers, and they are quite upset at the MPAA, too. Oh, yeah. That's like one, that's been one of my, you know, continuing crusades. And uh, I'm always quick to point out um, that, uh, for example, there were scenes in Terminator 2. I love Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. But Terminator 2 has scenes of um, extreme graphic violence, or what the MPAA would normally call extreme graphic violence, and sailed right through with an R rating. Other movies that have lower budgets and are not directed at a mass audience will be you know, persecuted so that the MPAA can make a political point of getting rid of this trash mm -hmm. but if you spend if you spend enough money if you spend 92 million dollars on your movie then it just sails right through so i mean it's it's a very hypocritical uh, very hypocritical system and it's hypocritical on the part of the video chains you know that get so self-righteous about oh we're not going to show anything that would offend families and then I, you know i don't see them turning down the terminator 2 uh <laughs> video sales you know, when the time mm -hmm. comes, so... But, well, uh, there was this one video group was going to release the series of John Waters films and backed out at the last minute. It's kind of hard to believe with home video that they are afraid, you know. You know, they're not afraid of the consumer. They're afraid of uh, the chains that uh, control the video stores. Yeah. Uh, that a lot of those guys have turned out to be uh, kind of weenies about, uh, you know... You're right excited and and uh, thing and you know ban ban the, a certain video from the store. So um, you know a lot of video stores wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't uh, sell um, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. A lot of them wouldn't. Uh, most of them would not uh, rent um, The Last Temptation of Christ simply because they didn't want they didn't want to get letters. They didn't want to get you know picketers or whatever at mm -hmm. the time and uh so uh yeah that's one of the we're a first amendment show drive-in theater is a first amendment show absolutely mm. need more like that by the way really do they uh do they john do they have any uh drive-in theaters where you're at and do you ever attend them well yes the um my favorite one just closed which was the uh, Route 35 drive-in in, in, in uh, Hazlitt, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. uh, it closed about a month ago, and it was the last drive-in in New Jersey, which is the birthplace of the drive-in. The first drive-in was in 1933 in Camden, New Jersey. But um, uh, there's one in uh, Westbury, New York. Mm -hmm. There are many in uh, upstate New York. There are many in uh, Massachusetts. Um, I, keep, I, I keep track of the drive-ins because everyone who has a favorite drive-in uh, writes me letters, mm -hmm. and especially if the drive-in gets in trouble or it's about to be closed down or mm -hmm. something, right. I'll hear all about it, you know, within yeah. a matter of a week or so. We had, um, where we uh, live, originally come from Illinois, they had two drive-ins there, and we lived right um, further up the East Coast. Really? Just one in Orlando? That's, that's it. Just one. 
It's one okay, of the great things in life that we miss because we is. were a mainstay at the drive-in. We actually watched uh -huh. the movies, too. I mean, oh, we yeah. were there for the movies. Yeah. You know? yeah. Well, you know, if you go down the highway to Fort Lauderdale, uh -huh. the largest drive-in in the world is the Swap Shop drive-in in Fort Lauderdale. I don't think that one's any longer there. It Are you probably is. Are you kidding me? No, I no, think it is, I, Becky. That's the one that we heard some stories about, about oh, things that might okay, possibly go I know, on Well, there. I know going by things that we've heard, a lot of them they've closed down and that, and they've turned around and, and turned them into flea markets. Yeah. Oh, and yeah, that. but this is one where the flea market owners kept the drive-in. Oh, okay. So that you, they have the flea market during the daytime. Oh, okay. They close up the flea market at 6 o'clock, and then everyone comes in, and they have 12 screens. Oh, wow. For the drive-in. And... Uh, then, now also, you should know this, in the past two years, about, I would say, 30 to 40 drive-ins have reopened. There's been a big uh, a return um, to the drive-in. Oh, well, that's great. Little mom-and-pop operations around the country that were just, uh, you know, they'd been closed four or five years. Yeah. Someone comes along, buys the land, opens it, and finds they can make a profit on it. And the reason is, people have been having babies like crazy. And the first thing that happens when you have a baby is you can't go to the movie theater anymore. Mm -hmm. But you can go to the drive-in. Yeah. And many people first went to the drive-in as a, as a toddler in the back of their parents' car anyway. Mm -hmm. So they associate it with, you know, childhood and the experience of having kids. And so especially young couples that have little, little kids start going to the drive-in, you know, as a... As a as a way to continue to go out, but you don't have to get a sitter and you don't have to deal with all that stuff. Can you remember the first time you went to the drive-in? The very first time? Like a long time ago. <laughs> Let's see. I'm sure it was. Uh, I'm sure it was with my parents, and uh, I. I probably. I was probably so young. Um, it would have been somewhere way out in West Texas when we lived in. Uh, in the panhandle of Texas, mm -hmm. um, you know the the first time I can uh, see the first time I can remember is we used to go to a drive-in in the um, which I think was called the the Chief Drive-in in, in uh, Dallas in the Oak Cliff part of Dallas. Um, but I, I, I always went to the, my parents were big uh, drive-in goers, and, um, would, and then I had two sisters later, and we would all be in the back seat, and then, then when I was a teenager, of course, I went to the drive-in all the time when I was in Little Rock, Arkansas. So it's always been a, a place where, and, and TV, TV viewers are older for the most part. Uh, the younger you are, it, it, the very, very young watch TV, but once, the, but the teenagers, college age, and a little after that, don't watch as much TV. They, yeah. They do other things. They're more active. So it's really two different kinds of people. Most of the letters I, I get, are from people who are nostalgic about the drive-in. Right. They haven't really mm -hmm. been to the drive-in recently. Um, or and, perhaps uh, even people that don't know what a drive-in was. Yeah, that's true. Especially. Uh, there are a lot of young people in very urban areas, you know, who have never, they know what one is, but they've never been to one. It's just like when you go to, when I go to England, um, everyone is fascinated with the drive-in. Of course, they've never seen the drive-in, but they know all about it, you know, from um, American culture and seeing it in movies and things. Mm -hmm. And Actually, Europeans are fascinated with the idea of a minute and watch a movie. They think that's so funny and charming and American that, <laughs> that they're just <laughs> full of uh, questions about it. I, be, I bet you the BBC calls me six times a year to do interviews <laughs> about the drive-in. You know, They just think it's the greatest thing in the world. Well, I'm sure due to the <laughs> Europeans that come to Orlando, there's actually an attraction at Disney MGM where you actually go to the drive-in. Oh, yeah. I was going to mention that yeah. because uh, the, the director of... Uh, the director of... Uh, at, uh, at at what is it? Disney MGM. Yeah, Disney yeah. MGM Studios. Yeah, he wrote me a he wrote me a letter and and enclosed some uh, some photos of that place, which I, actually is a restaurant, I guess. Yeah. 
And he even put, now this is a guy that works in his letter, um, I'm quoting exactly, lots of chicken breast, <laughs> gallons of thick blood red catsup in squirt ready containers, popcorn foo, roller skating waitress foo, food foo. And I wrote him back and I said, the guy's name is Dave Herbst. And I wrote him back and I said, Dave, it's a good thing for you that Walt is dead. <laughs> <laughs> And these are the same people that stopped showing the Pee Wee Herman video when he had his scandal. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I was gonna, I was gonna say, uh, basically, what you said there is, is what they put in when they first opened here not too long ago. Everything except the first part. <laughs> they did not print that in the Orlando paper. <laughs> and by the way, you're carried in the Orlando paper in your column. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I enjoy that. Yeah. Well, thanks. Over the years, I've gotten uh, letters from Orlando. Now, being a former sports writer, when you got into the field of uh, writing about these type of movies and so forth, the people that work with you or has worked with you, they ever say, John, you're nuts, it'll never sell. Nobody wants to hear about that kind of stuff. Well, no, I, I, never, I never heard that exactly, but the people that I worked with in journalism would, would, more, would say more things like... Uh, John, what are you wasting your career for? Mm -hmm. Why, why, why are you doing this junk, uh, junk culture stuff? You know, and it's, it, you, you know, you could be writing books, you could be doing, uh, you know, serious journalism. But I'll tell you what, it's like, it's like, um, it's like, why, why do you sell out, and go do show business when you could be doing like serious, important work? And uh, and uh, the answer is. For me, is that I, I did a lot of serious, important work. I did a lot of investigative journalism, and I did a lot of writing that was you would call very significant writing. And I have a book that I'm proud of. There's a, a, a murder case that's uh, you know that got some attention. Was a was a TV movie and everything. But but what was the name I, of that? It's called the book was called Evidence of Love. The TV movie was called. Uh, Killing in a small town, and uh, oh, okay. Barbara Hershey won an Emmy for it. But um, the uh, the uh, the truth is, I can reach more people in a more direct way, and and in many ways a more honest way, with comedy and with satire than any other thing I've ever found. Yeah, you can mm -hmm. show me a thousand serious editorials in a newspaper. You give me, you let me write one little 500-word piece, and I'll deliver it on the movie channel one night, and I will, um, I will make more of an impact on people than all of those thousand words, all of those thousand editorials put together. And it's not that it's not that I'm necessarily crusading for anything, mm -hmm. but this is the form, this is the the form of communication of 1991. It's not. It's not that it's not that I chose to be a writer or a performer or anything else. I chose to be a communicator, you know. And I'm just I'm just seeking the place where there's the maximum freedom and the maximum, um, uh, uh, you know, where I can express myself. Mm -hmm. Does it surprise you how powerful it can be at times? Um. Yeah, it's a little surprising that you do get so much. Uh, um, Mail, and you get so much um, uh, recognition, but it's it's also nice. I'm I'm not one of those guys that that like it doesn't like it or fears it or anything. Um, a lot of responsibility. I like uh, I I I think it's fine when when you know people see me and want to talk to me or you know and 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 but and by the same token, I've i like you meet so many people from from uh, outside your world this way you know it, it like broadens your horizon simply because you come in contact with people that see you on television and um, so uh, I think it's a good uh, it's a good thing it's a, it's an intimate uh, uh, medium and I like that about it too what do people think when they meet you on the street? Because you're you're very different than Joe Bob in the fact that you're soft-spoken as a 
I read in the article is very true, and you're very, you know, well mannered. Let me say that, you know, yeah. compared to Joe Bob. What do they think of you in person? What do they say? Well, people will accept anything if you're honest with them, you know. Yeah. And so um, they understand. You know, they, they generally they have a lot of questions like, uh, do you write all that stuff? Uh, do you, uh, uh, you know, how rehearsed is it? Uh, do you, uh, um, where do you do it? Uh, how'd you get the idea? You know, it's like. That, that's pretty much what people want to know. Uh, are you really like that? What's your, you know, what's your mother think of it? You, know? <laughs> you don't mind being approached at times, or? No, I never have. I never have minded it. You know, I'm not Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not like it impinges on my uh, freedom or anything. Like the old story of Paul Newman and why he doesn't like to give autographs because one time he was asked when he was standing at a urinal. <laughs> yeah, be I've a little him, embarrassing. I've heard him say that. Yeah, an autograph is really the easiest thing to give. Do you answer letters personally, or does time not permit that? Um, everyone who writes gets something in the mail. Mm -hmm. uh, it's no, it's no longer possible to answer um, every letter personally. Mm -hmm. So, um, one reason I started the newsletter was to keep in contact with people who wanted to be in contact with me, yeah. you know? And so I uh, send everybody a newsletter. How many uh, people do you have subscribed to that, by the way? Do you know offhand, or is that something Mary would know? That's something that Mary would know. I know the mailing list is about 30,000. Ooh. Oh. So, uh... Well, you've got Mystery Science beat. <laughs> They've got seven. Really? And they're very proud of it, too. <laughs> well, I guess... I, I, you know, I've never seen that. To be honest, I've never seen the show, but they've uh, they've just been on about what a year and a half or so. Yeah. 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 What about Gilbert Godfrey? Have you ever watched him? Um, I've just I just happened to uh, see him a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, the USA All Night shows um, uh, started after we did, and sometimes they annoy me a little bit because uh, uh, for for only one reason that sometimes they buy pretty good movies, pretty good drive-in movies. Mm -hmm. Then they cut them up in order to, they cut all the uh, nudity out of them, they cut all the um, mm -hmm. uh, gore out of them in order to be able to show them on the USA Network. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas if we'd been able to get them, you know, we could have showed them in their uncut, uh, in their uncut version. So I wish they would like just buy Honest R movies. On in soft R movies, and leave the uh, leave the, uh, uh, the the ones that need to be on premium cable to us. But you know, they seem to get an awful lot of trauma stuff too. Yeah, that's kind of hard to understand, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not that trauma doesn't occasionally have some entertaining movies, but I wouldn't want a steady diet of it. No. You know? Well, every once in a while, we found ourselves when the credits come up of saying, oh, no, trauma. But then again, they have had some good ones. Toxic <laughs> Avenger is pretty good, you know. Yeah, the original one is okay. Yeah. Monster in the Closet, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, but uh, what was that, Barbarian Queen Barbarian and Hell? Barbarian and oh. Dinosaur Hell. God. Yeah. This is really hard to sit through. Yeah, I, I find it very boring. Uh, you actually uh, watch all the movies that you show? I mean, like, precise to every minute or? Every minute. And you you're, actually, you're not saying I would falsify a breast count. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. You almost had to. Um, no, I, I, I watch every one of them. And, um, and these are all subject to what movie channel has available. I mean, you can't, like, go say, I want to film and get it for me or whatever. Oh, no, I can do that. Oh, you can do I that. I can do that. We have, um, I have a really good rapport with um, a guy named Dan Cohen who's the, uh, who acquires these films out on the West Coast. And uh, he's a fan. He's a he's a true believer mm -hmm. in uh, uh, drive-in movie. What I call drive-in movies or exploitation movies. So, for example, um, in February, mm -hmm. Dan and I have put together uh, Nurse Month, mm. the greatest nurse movies in history, um, which is a a neglected. Uh, genre you know it started i don't know if you know these movies but it started in 1973 with a movie called the student nurses oh yes it was a roger corman movie mm -hmm. yep. uh directed by stephanie rothman and then it was so successful that uh, they had uh 
night call nurses, private duty nurses, the young nurses, <laughs> candy stripe nurses, and everything. So we're going to have a tribute to the uh, nurse movie and have some of the original uh, stars on. That's always neat when you oh, can have the stars neat. on. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're, so we're going to do a lot of we're going to do a lot of stuff like that in the in the uh, coming year. You've been known to literally come out and say, this movie is no good, I don't like it, I'm not going to watch it, it's junk. What does the movie channel say about that? Well, when I first did it, um, they didn't like it. And I said, um, stick with me on this, believe me, it'll work. I said, I said um, first of all, nobody believes what anybody says about a movie. You know, even your wife, your husband, your closest friend... You're taking everything they say with a grain of salt. I mean, their opinion counts for a little bit more than somebody else's opinion. Mm -hmm. It's like, nobody believes it anyway, so you're going to watch at least a little bit to see how bad it is. Right. You know? Yeah. And then there's sort of a perverse pleasure you get in watching. If it's bad enough, uh -huh. then it becomes watchable. Right. The ones that aren't watchable are the ones in the middle that are just boring. They're yeah. just mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. you know, they're not they're not bad enough to be really bad. They're not good enough to be interesting. You know, those are those are unbearable. Right. Then the other thing I'll do on the ones that are that are truly horrible is I'll point out the two or three most horrible places in the movie. You know, where something happens that you just cannot believe it happens. For example, there's a scene in Blood Feast <laughs> where <laughs> I love this movie. Excuse me for Oh, for I love the movie, too. Oh, yes. But Herschel Gordon it. Lewis. I love it because it's Fellow so Floridian. Nice, you know? And, but the, the, there's a scene where Connie Mason, the worst actress in the history of the world, is actually reading her lines off a lampshade. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> and so I point out to the audience that we're going to see this, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's interesting to watch sometimes for uh, for things like that so now they let me do they let me do anything they, they let me say anything and uh, generally those are very um, honest assessments you know when I say we're going into the toilet we're going into the toilet you know <laughs> and uh, and when I say this is a four-star driving classic it generally it's a four-star driving classic and you and you and the and the, the, the and the, I've there's very rarely a case I, I know there's there are critics who often disagree with the public. You know, a movie will be very popular with the public, and the critic will hate it. Yeah. I, I, pra I have that problem practically never. Uh, of the people who love exploitation movies, my tastes are so close to what the majority of them uh, like mm -hmm. that I, I have rarely had a case where I say, this is a great movie, and everyone said, oh, that was horrible, or where I've said, we're going in the toilet, yeah. and they all write in and say, how could you say that? That was a wonderful movie. So mm -hmm. where with other critics when they say, don't go, that's the ones I always go to. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, know, people, you know, one of the secrets to Joe, Bob, is that people <coughs> hate critics, mm -hmm. you know? And so people identify with Joe Bob because he's not really a critic, you know? He's mm -hmm. just a guy that likes movies. This one newspaper article that I got sent on you, unless I read it wrong, sort of gave me the impression that you were kind of straying away from Joe Bob and wanting to do other things. Is that right? Uh, well, not that I'm straying away from it. Is that I just I'm just doing out. other things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I'm I'm continuing to do everything that I've ever done with uh, with uh, uh, Joe Bob. I'm just doing uh, um, you know some other kinds of writing and some other yeah. uh, acting things and and uh, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, uh, moving away from it. Well, I'm glad of that because I can tell there's a real love in what you do. Mm -hmm. And there has to be because being a video file myself and, and being into it and going to conventions and meeting other people, if you are a phony, these type of people that love these films will spot you in a second. Oh, I know it. I yeah. know it. They're yeah. very smart people that like these kind of films, unbeknownst to a lot of people who think they're crazy lunatics. Hey, yeah. John, let me ask you... Um, what does your wife Paula think of, of you doing this? Does she oh, go she with you it. when you when you do your travels? And when to did you meet Texas her? Oh and yeah, like she that? loves all of it. Uh, she she produces the um, the uh, show, oh, the drive-in theater. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's but, great. Uh, I met her. I met her about. Um, I met her about six years ago, at a at a writing conference. She was attending. I was speaking, and. Um, 
we were we've been married uh, a little over three years. Oh. But um, uh, no, she's all she's all for this stuff. Good. Um, and then the other thing, you know, you mentioned the the different uh, conventions and things where uh, exploitation movie fans gather or mm-hmm. horror fans or whatever. And I've been to a couple of those, and I always say right off the top when I get to those places, you know, let people understand that. I am not, by any means, an expert on exploitation movies because mm-hmm. there are experts, there are real experts who have seen thousands more titles than I have seen. Michael Weldon is one. If yeah. you're familiar with him, psychotronic, yeah. psychotronic movie guy to have it. Yeah. Uh, and um, there, there are other guys in the fanzine world, you know. And John Stanley, Horror Host himself, who has a good book out, Creature John Features. John Stanley, he was just my guest on my show last week. Yeah. And, and so um, uh, what I am is I'm the Isaac Asimov of this business. Okay. <laughs> I'm the popularizer, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like I take the basic research and I popularize it for the public. You know? Perhaps with a little Will Rogers thrown in, would yeah, you say? Yeah, that yeah, kind of, that kind of thing. So it's like... Um, uh, m- most of what my business is is is, uh, c- is is comedy and commentary, and and it's and it's not the. Uh, I'm never going to be the guy that's ever that's seen every Paul Nashy film or the guy that knows every obscure Dario Argento uh, du- uh, dubbed classic from his early career and all that. I'm familiar with what those films are. I've seen the the big ones, you know, but I'm like not the, I'm not the guy when it comes time to say, um, all right, here's the guy who has more knowledge of mm-hmm. drive-in movies than anybody in the world. Although, if you put me on a talk show, first thing I'll say is nobody knows about more, <laughs> nobody knows more about <laughs> drive-in movies than Do you I. think uh, fans expect you to know everything? Do um, they get disappointed no, when no, maybe no, you no, can't no. answer a question? No, they don't expect me to know everything. Usually, if they send me a question and I don't know the answer, I put it in the. Uh, I either read it on the air, or put it in my newspaper column, so that the so that the fans who read the column, they they will always know the answer. Somebody out there will know the answer. Yeah. Right. You know, and see, in the video world, there's so many videos, there's so many people watching the videos that that didn't watch these movies when they were in the theaters. So you have people asking questions about movies made in the 60s and in the 70s that most people have forgotten about, you know, that are being rediscovered in their video life. And so it's like it's almost impossible to keep up with everything that's going on. It's Joe Bob Presents, the sleaziest movies in the history of the world. Okay. And there are, uh, we've released uh, 16 of them. One of them is Blood Feast, your favorite. Oh, great. And oh, uh, most of them are made by either Herschel Gordon Lewis or uh, Doris Wishman. Doris Wishman, yes. And uh, Chesty Morgan. <laughs> Chesty Morgan. We got both of them. Uh, <laughs> Deadly Weapons and uh, uh, um, Double Agent 73. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... Um, and then we got a bunch of nudist camp films, but you know the classic nudist camp films from the early '60s, and what, the, these things called um, uh, roughies that mm-hmm. were made in the mid '60s. Mm-hmm. What are those? Well, those are those are stories of uh, young naive girls lost in the big city who get uh, used and abused by sleaze balls. Um, uh, Would like that be similar to uh, juvenile what is it, delinquent uh, films? Or? Times Square. It was like uh, after the nudist camp movies petered out, so to speak. Which was a good thing to say, yes. Yeah. Was, <laughs> <laughs> the only kind of sex film you could make, you know, that, that made a, that, that, that could get that audience back into the downtown theaters, it had to be, it had to be rougher. And so they had movies like The Corrupt, mm. you know, they were damned, they were corrupt. The titles were, were better than the movies. <laughs> They were people who cared for nothing except themselves, and you would always have these 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 real sleazy guys who would trick uh, uh, women who were new to the city. They were, most of them were set in New York, uh, to coming back to their apartment and uh, 
uh, they would supposedly they would be starting their acting career or something, and and they would um, they would corrupt them, and then they would be fallen women, and then they would be turned into prostitutes, and then they would be turned on to drugs, mm-hmm. and you would just see this growing degradation of this woman until the very end of the movie when she would realize what she was doing to herself and someone would help her get out of the vicious cycle and she would be okay at the end. So it was like 89 minutes of yeah. total degradation followed by one minute of redemption. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that lasted about four years, you know, with these roughies, they called them, because uh, they were rough. You know. so. Is uh, getting movies to release on video, which you are actually selling the movie, how much harder is that to get those than it is for just broadcast for, like, the movie channel? Well, um, in, the, in the case of the ones that I got, um, there was a collector um, uh, and, a, and a fan in, uh, who, who, who is at a company in uh, Los Angeles called Hollywood Poster and Video. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Who, um, uh, he had spent a good part of his life trying to put together all the rights to everything Herschel Gordon Lewis and Doris Wishman ever made. Mm-hmm. And so, and he did. He got almost all of it. I think everything except the Gorgor Girls. Yeah. And he, um, and he uh, took this package to a British company that was just coming into the video market in America called Strand Video. And, uh, and they said, well, we don't think we can sell these old movies. And uh, they started talking to me about giving them some kind of packaging that would make them watchable again. Yeah. And so that's how that particular deal came together. And in fact, they were absolutely right. It's like those those particular movies <coughs> you can watch if you know the story behind them. Yeah. And if you know the circumstances under which they were made. If you don't know the circumstances, you're likely to just write it off as a terrible movie. There's one that we released that I, I hope it becomes a, the next cult film. It certainly deserves to be seen by as many people as possible called Nude on the Moon, which uh, is a Doris Wishman film made in uh, southern Florida at a nudist camp where two rocket scientists buy a private rocket and go to the moon. And when they get on the moon, it's populated exclusively by nudists who are, who are uh, they call moon dolls. Yeah. Yes, I know exactly. Uh Terry, this is the, the, you're speaking of the nudist camp made down here in Florida. That's the one up in Kissimmee. Are you sure? Yes. That's not that one, is it? Yes, it is. That's the is one it? they call themselves the nudies. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. Is that right, that, John? Yeah. Is that one from Kissimmee? I, I can't remember the name of the of the uh, nudist camp where they made this one. This would have been about 1960. I was going to say it would almost have to be nostalgia because since I've lived here in Florida, so straight-laced, I haven't really seen anything going <laughs> Well, I think they still have those nudist camps down there, but they it's, do. Uh, but it's uh, uh, it's the best of the. You know, a lot of those yeah. nudist camp movies are just, you know, ugly people with acne playing volleyball for two hours. <laughs> but uh, why do you think something so bad that it's good is so popular today? Is because of uh, things that have went on, you know, in our past history in the world, or, or what? Well, uh, trash culture, popular culture, is very popular. Is very um, uh, big now, I think, because it's a form of comedy. You know, comedy is. We're in an era of comedy, and people like to uh, like to laugh at. Well, one thing they like to laugh at is their parents. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, a lot of these things are symbols of their parents. You know, and um, uh, you know, it's 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 a form of. Um, it's a form of humor. Now, the people who made these movies don't ever understand. No. They don't ever understand why. Doris Wishman has no idea why anyone would watch Nude on the Moon today. Because I asked her about it, and she said, those, those people are so ugly. How can you watch that? What about Roger Corman? I think he's kind of in tune to why people like him, isn't he? Yes, because Roger Corman, he's the, to, to me, he's the intellectual of the exploitation film yeah. world. He has always incorporated humor and a camp element into everything he did because he didn't have the budget ever to do something straight. He could not make the Terminator, but he could make a version of the Terminator that had that had as its basis a 
parody of that form. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, sure so the camp is is built into the show. You watch uh, if you watch Little Shop of Horrors today, you watch it on the same uh, satiric level that you watched it in 1960 or 61, whenever it was made. Um, it his movies his movies hold up as um, as a popular culture. A after a certain point, the really early ones, the monster movies and things, don't really hold up. They don't they don't scare us anymore. Yeah. But the uh, but everything he made after a certain point still holds up. I can still watch uh, the Wild Angels, for example, and uh, even though it's very 60s, it's got Nancy Sinatra in it. It's got Bruce Dern. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got uh, Peter Fonda. That's one of the fun part of those movies too. Is is people that are really famous today that made those movies back then when they were nobodies, and yeah. a lot of times they don't want to admit they made them, but they did. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun to look at that stuff. But his movies, any movie that's well made, will will last. Yeah, you know, you're not no too. Matter, no matter what its its original purpose. I can imagine you're not too fond of, let's say, for instance, the uh, remake of Little Shop with Rick Moranis. Oh, the musical. Yeah. Well. You know, one of my one of my uh, guilty secrets is that I like musicals. Oh, okay. And so <laughs> it's out now. And so, uh, yeah, I did. I did uh, like that. I never got to see the stage show. They everyone tells me yeah. the stage show was better, but um, but uh, I thought Steve Martin was great. <clears throat> oh yes, he uh, stole the whole show. Yeah, absolutely. Let me ask you this. This is a question that's really been perplexing me. Long time ago, back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, horror hosts were really popular. Now it's down to just about Elvira, maybe a few here and there. Why do you think they're not as popular today as they once were? Why today does everybody come on as basically themselves or some normal-looking character? Um, well, if you look at those early horror hosts, um, what they had in common was um, an understanding of the movies. Most of those horror hosts began with w what's called the uh, Universal Syndication Package. That was the Frankenstein and Dracula movies mm -hmm. and all the great Universal horror classics. That was the original horror package on TV and every market had it and it played uh, late at night because it was not considered uh, suitable for young children. And uh, each station packaged it differently. And if you talk to a guy like John Zacherly, who's the, the original, you know, the, the real pioneer of that business. He has a bit part in Frankenhooker. Right, and uh, he's been a guest on my show a couple of times and has recreated his old act. Uh, but uh, John um, um, loved those movies and would actually even go so far as to cut pieces of film where he put himself in the movies yeah. during the during the scenes and uh, uh, he understood them and so his act was a parody of the movie you were watching mm -hmm. um, then um, uh, the same was true uh, then uh, the, the next guy that I think really made a strong impact was uh, Goulardi yeah. you know who he was yes uh, guy in uh, Cleveland, Ernie Anderson, he's also been on my show. He, uh, uh, Goulardi was not, didn't care that much about the movie, but he was a true, um, uh, what do you call it, a, uh, a, uh, a re an anarchist, mm -hmm. a revolutionary. He just destroyed everything. So that's what kids always love, somebody yeah. who's like, destroying everything around him, making fun of everything, making fun of everything adult. And uh, so that was the, uh, that was the, the uh, uh, secret to his success. The, the better, the, the, only, the only way you can be a good horror host is you have to be um, uh, a misfit. And the more of a misfit you are, the more it goes with the exploitation movies. Because exploitation movies are always outlaw movies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it takes an outlaw to love the outlaw movies. Mm -hmm. Did you ever contemplate being a horror host and putting on the makeup? And oh, you mean that, that type of horror host? Uh, uh, no, not really. Mm -hmm. 
it's not uh, first of all the movies are different you know I show I show modern movies yeah uh, in order to put on the makeup it would take five hours <laughs> I, would have yeah. to, I would have to put on a full body cast to do most of that makeup mm-hmm. um, you know in uh, uh, most of the horror hosts that did uh, that worked in makeup in the 50s were doing a version of Dracula yeah always uh, so um, it's a little bit different thing and we relate to the movies in a different way too people in the 50s actually believed that were actually scared by the um, psychological situation being shown on the screen mm-hmm. even if it had a monster in it Today, we have a, a hipper audience, yes. and a lot of times they understand that what they're being scared by is the effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, in a, in a really well-made movie, the effect is a completely appropriate, you know, to what's going on on the screen. Mm-hmm. But they're not. Uh, it's like they're in on the they're in on the technique, and so you have to be in on the technique with them, you know. Um, well, everybody's pretty aware of makeup and how they do things and everything these days too. Yeah. Yeah, you got to be a little hipper than uh, than uh, uh, John Zachary. Have you had a chance to be in, uh, in any of these movies? Let's see. I was in... Uh, I heard you were in Texas Chainsaw 2, but unfortunately it wound up on the floor. Is yeah, I right? got cut out of Texas Chainsaw. Well, I got cut up in Texas Chainsaw. Is that what happened? They cut you up in the scene? And then I got cut out. <laughs> <laughs> I got chainsawed in the movie, and then I got... My scene got chainsawed. And then uh, in... Uh, I was in... Uh, was Toby Hooper on the set quite a bit with that? or I heard he didn't oh, have yeah. too much to do with that one. Oh, no. It was number three that he didn't have anything to do oh, with. Oh, okay. He was, uh, he was there the whole time. Uh, then um, uh, I was in Hollywood Boulevard Part 2 with... Uh, you know, that's those are like insider parodies mm-hmm. of Roger Corman. Yeah. You know, and so uh, they have to be in that. And then... Um, I've had uh, I've had uh, numerous offers to be in various uh, <laughs> various horror films, but usually it's like too time consuming to mm-hmm. go to whatever strange place it is they're doing it. You know, just to do the. Do you think it helps getting offers like that with doing what you do? It helps getting offers to do movies. Oh yeah, usually it's because they're a fan of the show or they're a fan of. Um, a fan of the, you know, the work that I do. So, on mm-hmm. the uh, movies that you've been in, would you ever find yourself showing them on the uh, the uh, bit that you do? Yeah, let's see. Or would you? Or would you? I mean, what what would your feelings be about showing a movie that you are actually in? Um, it, it completely fits the personality of Joe Bob to to show a movie repeatedly that he's in. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, no, I don't have any problem with it. Uh, well, we we showed uh, we showed Great Balls of Fire. I'm in that. Yeah. What'd you do in that? I was uh, Dewey Phillips, the uh, the uh, DJ. Oh, okay. Really oh, me more okay. Than saw me, and I was doing a different accent. I was doing yeah. a more of a Memphis accent, yeah. and so uh, and and I looked completely different. So. What do you think about Dennis Quaid's portrayal? Uh, my personal opinion, and you give yours, it was more like a comic book adaption of Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, I'll tell you what. I thought that, too, when I first saw Dennis doing it on the set mm-hmm. until I saw Jerry Lee Lewis. Okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's something. And he was pretty right on about the way he is. He really does talk and act like that. I was backstage yeah. one night. He was so drunk. He walked by, didn't even recognize his own daughter. It was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. But he kind of acts like a comic book character, you know? So what can you do? Do you collect videotapes? No, I don't. I, oh, really? Uh, after I watch them, I give them away to the fans. Oh, um, wow. I get sent uh, hundreds of them. And uh, the idea that I would ever go back and and look at them again gets to be pretty remote. And so, um, do you think that perhaps they send you stuff with hopes of getting mentions on on the air for promoting their product? And then, of course, you can't do that, right? Or 
Oh, no. Occasionally we mention upcoming movies on the air, and then a lot of times the, uh, they're sent to me just because they want to be reviewed in my column. Yeah. And a lot of times they're sent to me because uh, they want they want the movie channel to buy them to put on my show. And then, uh, uh, then you know, amateur filmmakers send me their films or filmmakers that don't have a uh, distribution deal. You ever show those? Deal. We just showed the first one that we've... They're fun. It's not strictly an amateur uh, film, but it's a film made in Charlotte, North Carolina for mm. $9,000 mm. by a guy named uh, Tony Elwood uh, called Killer. And we just showed it about uh, three weeks ago. Oh, great. And it's the first one where I've ever said, you know, this one is really... This is a guy who had made this film, and he was literally going from video to vi video store to video store, talking to mom-and-pop owners yeah. into renting his video and I saw it and I liked it and um, and so we we ran it as the cheapest movie ever made in the history of the world <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so yeah it, it happens you know a lot of people now one thing we won't do is we won't show a movie that's shot on video they yeah. just look so horrible oh, yeah. yeah but we did show this movie even though it was shot on 16 millimeter film so it didn't really it really didn't look as good as a normal movie, but the difference is not that great, mm -hmm. so that you, yeah. so that it looks terrible. It still has good lighting and everything. I hear you have a very busy schedule. Do you ever get a chance to ever really watch anything on TV? Um, you know, when I watch something on TV, I usually watch something that's kind of far removed from what I do. So, yeah. you know, I get tired of just watching uh, comedy or or movies or something. <coughs> so usually, when I do watch TV, I'm watching sports or news or something entirely different. I kind of got hooked this summer on this new cable channel, Court TV. Oh, oh boy, that's got to that's got be like the most boring channel on the air. You think that's boring? Oh, yes. Oh, man, they've had some murder trials on there that just, uh, <laughs> that just uh, were, were, that fascinated me. Do you have cable or you have a satellite dish? Uh, cable. Okay, let me ask you this. As we are partly a satellite dish magazine, what do you think of satellite dish owners, satellite dishes, and those that subscribe to your, your show there on the movie channel? Satellites are the best thing that ever happened to America because, um, see, for example, I've spent a lot of time in, um, in New York. I've spent a lot of time in Texas. And I've spent a lot of time in the Midwest. It used to be that... Um, uh, the most uh, uh, sophisticated people were on the East Coast as far as the people who had seen and everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, any new thing, any new trend in music, uh, film, uh, theater, whatever came along, the East Coast got it first and they all saw it and they were all aware of it and everything. Now it's completely reversed. You go out in the country, you know who has seen everything? The guy in western Kansas with a, with a satellite dish in his yard who has 914 channels. Mm -hmm. He right. has seen everything. everything. Yep. I mean, and you notice it when you go, you notice it with audiences. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to these parts of the country where they have, where they're big satellite watchers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They know everything. They've seen everything. They're aware of stuff going on in Europe, stuff going mm -hmm. on in New York, stuff going on everywhere else. You know, whereas, you know where you know one of the most provincial places is New York City. Mm -hmm. You know they haven't seen anything. <laughs> you know New York City is aware of New York City. Well, it's probably because there's so much entertainment on the streets. That's it. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> and so it's like uh, the old uh, the old uh, stereotypes about America. You know about about there being these backwaters mm -hmm. out in the middle of America. You know that are isolated from everything. As soon as you put satellites in those communities, they became some of the most well-informed people in the world. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I think it's great. You know, it's yeah. like it I'm so glad to hear that. It I'm brings glad, everything yeah. in the country closer together. Well, that's good to hear that you don't mind having people pick you up directly. Then. Oh no. Yeah. I have people in in uh, South America pick me up directly. It's yeah. probably illegal, but they do. Yeah. <laughs> you get letters from. 14-year-old oh, girls in Guyana, you know, wow. <laughs> watching this show. Well, they're, they're real fans, too, because, like, for instance, with our case, we're a satellite dish owner. And there's many times we'll subscribe to a network just for one show. And that's a real fan. Oh, That'll yeah. pay your, your 90 or $150 a year or whatever to get one show, you know. 
Oh yeah, they're they're the they're the best, and uh, and they're real TV watchers. You yeah. know, they're real TV fans. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have cable, but they're not really TV uh, people. You know, they just have it for one reason. What do you think of the concept of home theater with everybody with their big screen TVs now trying to get the theater effect at home? Do you have any of that yourself, or? Yeah, I have. Just for the past about a year ago, I got a um, a um, big screen, seventy inch. Oh. Great. So, you beat uh, us. We got a fifty-five. You beat us. <laughs> really? Ours isn't even maybe three weeks old. <laughs> and, but, but you know, I, I could have gotten it earlier, but I'd never seen one that um, had the sufficient um, quality. Yeah, exactly. You know? That's. That was the problem with when I first seen them come out and everything. They look so unfocused, you yeah. know. Now they're great. And this one, uh, it's just so terrific. I mean, uh, even even live events look mm -hmm. terrific on it. So it it's and it makes a whole difference in in how you watch uh, how you watch TV. And I would think that in the future it would make a difference in how they how they make TV. Mm -hmm. You don't have to just have a couple of heads in close-up on there talking anymore. You can actually do uh, more movie-type shots. You can yeah. do landscapes. You can do long vistas and things right. uh, when people, st when more people start getting the bigger screen. Mm -hmm. Are you they into... Tell me, they uh, tell me that as soon as the Japanese get it perfected that everyone will have it because it'll be so cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Are you into, like, let's say, video disc or anything like that? Or maybe for our surround yet, but I'm sure that I could easily fall in love with it. Uh, um, but I don't have that equipment yet. With the uh, concept of the home theater and that with the big screen TVs coming out and VCRs and everything, do you think that will eventually or may uh, someday be so huge with the economy and everything that people will just like stop going to theaters and stop going to drive-ins and just stay at home? Or well, that might hurt the drive-in industry or the movie industry? Well, I think it's hurt it about as much as it can hurt it. I don't think there's going to be... I mean, we're at the all-time high level in terms of number of hours a day that the set is on mm -hmm. in the American household. You know, I mean, it's, up, it's some phenomenal number, like seven hours and some minutes a day already. And so um, I think, you know, they've been saying that um, uh, movie theaters would die out ever since, uh, you know, they said uh, radio would kill it, and they said TV would kill it, and they said uh, uh, the VCR would kill it, and movie theaters hang on because people have to have a place to go that's affordable mm -hmm. when yeah. they go out. Mm -hmm and especially young people and especially daters, mm -hmm. you know. There's got to be some place <laughs> to go, especially in a community that doesn't have um, um, a lot of other nightlife, you know. Like or, Florida. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, I know. I, I had to excuse our comments. We're not going to find out where we live. <laughs> We're not, okay. <laughs> uh, but no, I think, and especially as the movie experience becomes more... Um, uh, you know, they're also making all kinds of technological improvements in how you watch movies. Mm -hmm. So um, as the theaters get more elaborate and nicer and they're starting to clean them up and the seats are more comfortable and, uh, and they've, they've understood that a lot of people stay away because the theaters have been dirty and because they've been noisy and they've taken measures to fix that. And it's like they're much more service-oriented yeah. simply because they don't want to lose their audience. Mm -hmm. And so for all those reasons, I think, you know, uh, they're not mutually exclusive. I and think it would help if you if they would hold the movies back from uh, uh, pay-per-view release a little bit longer, or perhaps pay-per-view. What do you think about pay-per-view? Well, pay-per-view, you still got that uh, that five or six dollar charge. I think that's that's uh, essentially the same as movie going experience. You're just de you're just deciding whether you want to watch it on your smaller screen in your home or whether you actually want to go to the theater and it's about the same it's about the same amount and for people who literally can't get to the theater you're, you're always amazed when you work on TV of the amount of mail you get from people who are because of some illness or some physical condition uh, TV is their outlet to the world mm. so you want to try to make as much available to people who 
for whom TV, or the, the elderly, you know, TV's their only, um, mm -hmm. their only choice. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you before we go here, and I sure appreciate you staying on all this time with us. It's really been great. Sure. About your hubbies and your five favorite films and your five favorite actresses and actors. Okay, well, the Hubby Awards are the Drive-In Academy Awards, which we've given every year for about 10 years now. And, um, um, you know, we have uh, Best Flick, Best Actor, Best Actress, Breast Actress, um, Best Bad Guy, Best Kung Fu, Best Dialogue, Best Director, Best Gross Out Scene. And we give those every year, in, um, usually in uh, April. Um, and then uh, top five movies number one is always the Texas Chainsaw Massacre the, the saw is still the king after all these years because mm -hmm. um, even though other people have surpassed it in terms of the level of shock value for its time when it came along no one had ever seen anything like that mm -hmm. and it was an extremely well made film and it's it's a it's a tribute to how much it bothered people that still 18 years later it's still cited in congressional hearings as an example of the kind of thing congressmen do not want in this country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they always yeah. use the example of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as the type of movie we don't want that doesn't represent good American values. That's how revolutionary and what an outlaw film that was mm -hmm. even though everyone today agrees it was also an extremely well-made film right. absolutely especially for the amount of money the guy had to do it with the first name somebody can come up with when you mention horror they always mention that or night of the living dead usually right and in night of the living dead would probably be number two on my list um, the original one even though i thought i'm a minority in this opinion but I thought the remake of Night of the Living Dead was also excellent. Yeah, I, I, thought, I thought the guy did a great job on it. Are you talking about uh, the new color one that Tom Savini was at the helm of? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I like that one, too. But the original one uh, had the same kind of impact. You know, no one had ever seen anything like yeah. that. And, and um, I would say Hellraiser is the best movie of the 1980s and a new direction in, in horror. And... Uh, um, Claire Higgins in that movie gives one of the best performances I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, only woman who can actually lose all her skin and still be sexy. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, let's see, I would put um, I would put the um, I would put the Evil Dead on that list. And what would I choose for number five? There's so many choices from so many. I'll tell you what I would put for number five. Put I'll put one one foreign film on there. Um, Suspiria. Oh yeah. Uh, With the late Joan Collins. I mean, not Joan Collins. <laughs> the lady from Dark Shadows. What's her name? Her name escapes me. Uh, Jessica Harper. Yeah, right. but also it had the lady that played Mrs. Collins in Dark Shadows. I'll think of her name after I get off the okay. phone. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, okay, what was next? Best Actresses? Yeah, Actresses um, and Actors. Well, I would, uh, if we were to choose a Scream Queen from each, uh, from each era, then it would have to be uh, Mamie Van Doren from the 50s. And then you have... Uh, 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 Barbara Steele from the 60s and Claudia Jennings in the 70s and then in the 80s you have um, you have uh, I guess I guess the top one is uh, is uh, Linnea Quigley and then you have to put you have to put two, you have to put one woman on there just for two roles and uh, and her name is Barbara Crampton, mm -hmm. and she's on there for Reanimator and From Beyond. Mm -hmm. Apparently, claims she won't make any more horror films, but a lot of them say that. So, is there any any of your uh, tastes in B movie queens or movie queens of that sort of flow over 
of how you were attracted to your wife? Does she have any of these qualities? Or? Um, well, she can be very scary. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, not really, no. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, actors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, I would say Charles Bronson. Uh, Arnold, who we always call Arnold the Barbarian, <laughs> because I, m- most of what I admire is his early work, not his, uh, not when he started making, uh, you know, comedies and yeah. big budget comedies and mm-hmm. stuff. Although I love Terminator too. Um, let's see, who else would be on that list? Um, well, I think. Uh, do you know this guy, William Smith? Yes, I do know him. William he had a very good early film of where his father was a vampire. Yeah. Uh, it was Grave he, of the Vampire. He's yeah. probably made 200 movies, yeah. and he usually plays a bad guy yeah. or a Hell Comes a to Frogtown. Yeah. But he's great. Um, uh, Lance Henriksen is in that same category of just one of the most intense actors on the screen. Great bad guy. Uh, great sleazeball. Um... And um, I would say in the, I should have a martial arts guy on there. And, uh, well, it's got to be Bruce Lee. Yeah. You can't, you can't be, everyone's been trying to emulate Bruce Lee. You talk an awful lot about Dolph Lundgren lately, too. Yeah, Dolph Lundgren is, you know, he hadn't quite, he hadn't quite made it yet. I'll tell you who I was impressed by as the, the real star of the future, though. Brian Bosworth in Stone Cold. Yeah. I know he who had, he is. I haven't seen any of He had a yet. quality and a presence and a power in that movie that uh, I, I feel like he's, he could be a great action hero of the future. Mm-hmm. Well, I thank you very much for your answers. It was great, and you really gave a good interview, unlike <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried at times, who was very, very hard to interview. I asked him what he thought of Joe Bob Briggs. And he said, to tell Joe Bob, I think he's very, very sexy. I want him to have my baby and make me squeal like a pig. <laughs> <laughs> he's very hard to interview. He gave answers like that all the time. But. Well, I think he's that way 24 hours a day. So <laughs> uh, You're not the only one that has said that. Not only is he hard to interview, but he, he totally does not have, uh, like you and, and Joel from Mystery Science and Rhonda and that, have the same voice. His voice is You is cannot different. tell. I could not tell it was... That's a character Gilbert voice he does. Oh, really? His voice yes. is really different. His voice is really different. Well. Yeah, he has a low uh, Bronx accent. that does Very not low. sound like Gilbert at all. Oh, that's true. Where Rhonda Shear, who is also a very good breast actress, very good-looking lady, she sounded just like, you, you know... Yeah. yeah. Have you ever viewed her at all? You know, I think, is she on Friday night? Yes. She will be on tonight at 11. She'll be showing uh, Killer Tomatoes, Killer Tomatoes 2, and she'll be squashing them with her feet and, and stuff like that, wearing tomato costumes and, okay, and so forth. Okay, I'll watch.